Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about genome. And the main topic is actually the largest genome in the animal kingdom. Can you guess what has the largest genome ever? What organism do you think has essentially the longest DNA of all of the organisms on the planet? Now this question actually has several answers depending on what organism you look at, but in general we're actually going to be focusing on the so-called vertebrates, on the animals. And in this case, of all of the animals in the world, surprisingly, humans are not even close to having the longest genome. The longest one belongs to something entirely different. But let's actually discuss the idea of DNA and genome, because it's actually a super fascinating topic. If you've ever taken high school biology, you probably still remember that the DNA of human beings, and pretty much DNA of most of the advanced organisms, is made up of these chromosomes. And humans, as you might remember, have 23 pairs. In other words, there are 46 of them in total. And so, for example, when you hear someone talk about the human genome, it basically means all of the chromosomes plus the genetic material from inside our mitochondria. For various evolutionary reasons, mitochondria have their own DNA. And though most of the genome's DNA is right here inside the nucleus of a cell, there's a little bit of it here in the mitochondria as well. But I remember back in the days when I was still trying to study all of this, I had a lot of questions about all of these molecules, all of these chromosomes, and I really wanted to understand how all of this is packed inside the nucleus. Most of the teachers unfortunately didn't always have answers, so I basically went on these long tracks trying to discover all of the answers. And well, it turns out it's actually a really, really complex process and a really complex structure that when you start learning kind of becomes super fascinating. So first of all, one of the questions I always had is, are these molecules, are these chromosomes actually connected to one another or are they completely separate? And turns out that inside our nuclei right now, inside our cells, all of these chromosomes are essentially these separate molecules. So inside each of the nucleus of most of the cells, you're going to discover 46 of these very specific molecules wrapped into these really, really tight shapes. So tight as a matter of fact that of approximately 2 meters or 6 feet of length of the DNA, you can essentially fit all of them into the tiny, tiny nucleus of a typical cell. And when I found out how long this thing was, it kind of blew my mind. Now, I'm one of those people that actually still uses earbuds with an actual cable to listen to stuff on my phone. And because of very unusual properties of long objects, such as cables, my earbuds always get tangled into these tight knots that I have to untangle once in a while. But through billions of years of evolution, the nature has found a way to keep all of these cables, all of these DNA strands, completely separate from one another, and despite their length, they never get entangled. Not even once. And that is absolutely fascinating. And what's more is that nature also found a very efficient and very interesting way of storing all of these DNA molecules inside the nucleus as well. For example, I was always wondering, how are these chromosomes stored inside the cell? Do they just kind of freely move around? Do they kind of float around in this large vessel? Or is there a certain way that they're stored so that the cell actually knows where they are and so that they can actually be used efficiently? Well, it turns out the answer is the latter. Each chromosome has a very specific individual location inside the nucleus, each stored forming this very unusual shape that kind of looks like this. And this is as tight as you can pack them inside the nucleus of a typical cell. Now remember, each of these is a separate molecule, with the shortest one being roughly around 15 million base pairs long, with a single base pair basically being something like this. It's two molecules connected together. And so the smallest one has 50 million of these, and the largest one has roughly around 260 million. And each of them then gets rolled up and sort of stored in this particular shape you see right here. Although this is only for humans. Each animal and each species will have different number and obviously different shapes forming, and depending on the number of chromosomes and their length, this is of course going to be very different. But now let's talk about the length of different genomes and also how this length possibly relates to various organisms. So in general, human genome is actually on the longer side, but it's not the longest. And here it's also important to understand that the genome's length itself does not actually represent the complexity or the intelligence of the organism in any way, neither does it make the organism in some way more successful. So it's actually very interesting how the length of the genome doesn't actually correlate with anything. Although, okay, that's not entirely true. Genome size does correlate with the type of the organism you're looking at. So viruses will have the shortest of the genomes, 
the ancient bacteria known as archaea will have the second shortest, then we'll have regular bacteria, and lastly we'll have eukaryotes, or the true cells. And that's of course all of the advanced organisms on the planet, and all of the cells that we are made out of as well. But even amongst these organisms, there are always a lot of exceptions, and this is where things get a little bit more interesting. Now first of all, just like I mentioned, the length of a chromosome doesn't mean much. As a matter of fact, in the human genome, only about 2% of the entire length of all of the chromosomes are responsible for producing you, for producing the proteins that you're made out of. Everything else are extras. So of everything you see right here, only 2% is used by the body, by the cells, to produce other cells. And here's what the typical human genome will look like. It will have only 2% of genes responsible for various proteins, and the rest of the genome is actually going to be made up of other things. Now, back in the days when I was in high school, the biology teacher referred to these as junk DNA. But in the last decade or so, actually in the last couple of decades, the scientists realized that this is a completely wrong term to use. A lot of this extra stuff that's there is really important. We just don't really know what most of it is yet. We've discovered, for example, that a lot of it is responsible for assisting fetal development, such as various genes that came from various viruses that are still inside our genome. There's actually a video about this somewhere up there. But also a lot of them are these so-called jumping genes or transposable elements, also known as transposones. These unusual genes are responsible for, well, basically relocating once in a while through the entire strand of the DNA. Their only job seems to be to jump. And they do this for various random reasons once in a while. And it seems that the length of the genome depends directly on how many of these transposones are located inside the cell. So animals with the longest genome will actually just have more of these transposones on the inside, at least for the most part. And their only job is to jump. But why do they do so and how is it helping us? Turns out that by jumping around, they do actually introduce occasional mutations into proteins. And this is basically evolution in, in a nutshell. By jumping around and by occasionally changing the genetic code, they can cause mutations that can then lead to either advantages or disadvantages. But what about the length? Well, in terms of the length, like I said, humans are on the longer side, as well as organisms like typical monkeys, apes, even mice actually. Usually the length of the genome here is going to be between two and possibly three and a half billion base pairs. So if you were to think about one base pair being, for example, one byte, a typical human genome will actually contain about 3.3 gigabytes of information. Certain monkeys and certain apes will even have more, and mice that we often use in experiments will have about 2.7 billion. And for most mammals, the length is usually a few billion pairs. For fish and for things like birds, it's less. It's usually actually less than a billion. Surprisingly, the genome in a typical bird is much shorter than other animals. And one of the reasons scientists believe so is because birds, for some reason, lost a huge chunk of the genome when they started to adapt to flying. Now, that's not something we can prove yet, but that's the usual explanation to why their genome is shorter. So, for example, a typical chicken will have something around 1 billion base pairs. But the question is, what has the longest genome we've found so far of all of the animals? And when I originally learned the answer, it really surprised me, but then I started thinking about it, and it kind of all made sense. One of the longest genomes you can find is actually inside of this really strange, somewhat ugly, and somewhat unusual creature known as the lungfish. In this case, we're actually talking about the Australian lungfish because that's the one that was recently investigated in the paper that, as always, you can find in the description below. And we've always known that the lungfish genome was really long, but all of the studies about them were actually decades old and using a very old technology that was not actually accurate. The recent study used an extremely accurate way to calculate all of this using some really sophisticated computer techniques and essentially discovered that a typical lungfish will have a genome that's about 14 times longer than the one inside humans. About 43 billion base pairs or basically about 43 gigabytes of information. But that's also around 100 times longer than a typical fish, such as this little guy. So something here doesn't actually add up. How can this fish have a short DNA or short genome, yet this strange creature having a genome that's about 100 times as long? And though there is no actual real explanation just yet, there is a pretty good speculation and also a potential explanation to how evolution works as well. 
The thing about lungfish, which by the way exist on all major continents, is that we believe them to be what's known as a living fossil. There are types of creatures that haven't really changed genetically, haven't evolved much, in millions and millions of years. And for these fish, it might have been as long as 200 or even 300 million years. Essentially today, most scientists believe that the lungfish right here are the very important evolutionary link between the land animals and the fish right before they became land animals. But unlike other lungfish that probably evolved into other animals, these lungfish, for some reason, stopped their evolution and remained as they were millions and millions of years ago. Now we actually have some other living fossils out there, the famous one being the tree known as Ginkgo biloba, and what seems to unite all of them is that they all possess these very, very long genomes. In other words, their genetic code seems to be extremely long compared to some of the other species similar to them. And this by itself is an important clue to potentially how evolution works and how it helps animals and other creatures evolve. When the genome is too short, the evolution is going to be too fast, there are going to be too many mutations, and chances for the organism to survive, especially in stable conditions, are not going to be very high, because for stability you need the DNA to be stable. But if the DNA molecule is too long, if the mutations will take too long, and if it also keeps growing larger and larger, at some point all of those jumping genes that I mentioned before, all of those transposones, are going to be simply unable to mutate the DNA molecule. So they're going to be jumping around, but they're not going to be affecting any of the proteins. And so the evolution at this point kind of stops, because the DNA molecule, the genome, became extremely long, unable to mutate. Now it might work well for some creatures like these guys, so longfish might actually benefit from it and survive for pretty much hundreds of millions of years, but it obviously did not help everyone. And some fish, and especially some longfish that probably existed at that time as well, did go extinct. And there are actually signs of this in many different fossils we've discovered over the past uh, few decades. And so by itself, the study is actually extremely interesting in trying to understand how life evolved on the planet, and in trying to understand how the length of the genome may actually play a role in various other creatures as well. But in case of the lungfish, there are just so many cool things about it that it's actually kind of difficult to cover all of this in one video. For example, one of the reasons they're called lungfish is because they do have a lung. They can actually breathe air without the presence of water. And some lungfish in certain countries can even survive dry conditions when the water disappears completely. This adaptation obviously helped the lungfish to eventually evolve into other creatures. Interestingly, they also contain many different adaptations, specifically genetic adaptations, to survive on land. Many of them have feet-like formations, many of them have something that resembles a nose and can actually smell molecules, unlike other fish, and obviously all of them have lungs as well. But at the same time, they also contain a tremendous amount of genes that are only in fish. So these lungfish are both terrestrial animals and fish, and they contain DNA and actual genes from both types of the creatures. And so some scientists believe that lungfish are basically like libraries of different types of genes and different DNA molecules from various species across the evolutionary timeline, and so studying them is actually super important in helping us understand how life evolved and how life progressed and essentially moved from the oceans to the land and then evolved afterwards. But when it comes to the longest genome in the world of all of the creatures, including bacteria and so on, they're still not the winners. There's actually something else that has even longer genome, at least according to some of the older studies. One of them is this strange flower known as Paris japonica, with a genome that's roughly around three times as long at 150 billion base pairs. And one of them is an amoeba-like creature, or basically a single cellular organism, known as Polycaeus dubium. And this organism has a genome that's about 670 billion base pairs long, which is about 15 to 16 times longer than the genome inside the lungfish, and about 200 or so times longer than the one inside of humans. And so once again, the length of the genome does not seem to correlate with the complexity of the organism, intelligence, or anything else. It does seem to correlate with evolution though, and that's something that we actually are trying to understand right now, especially in learning more about how various complex life arose on Earth and how it could potentially do so on other planets as well.
But I guess for now that's really all I wanted to mention in this video. The paper and all of the links I used today are as always in the description below. So thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space, sciences and biology, and come back tomorrow to learn something else. Also maybe support this channel on Patreon or by buying the wonderful prison t-shirt you can find in the description. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye bye.